I've been, uh, while Aaron was talking about corn and soybeans, I started looking at a couple of other things uh, that I might want to talk about. And, uh, and so I'm going to kind of go through the slides pretty quick just because um, I want to, there, there's a, another subject I want to talk about. I've changed my tune a little bit from the, the last meeting. Uh, I, th I think uh, we may be at the bottom of the price cycle. I, I was in, in the, I guess the, the, the August meeting and probably I think we had a June meeting. I was, I was kind of expecting feeder cattle prices to go lower next year than what they were this year. Our calf prices, feeder cattle prices, I don't care which one. Um, but after we've gone as low as we've gone and then looking at the slaughter numbers and my expectations for inventory going into 2020, uh, I think we may be at the bottom of the price cycle right now. Uh, and, and, I, and then we can show those prices, uh, but let's just start with, with some slaughter cattle prices because that's gonna be the driver of, of these calf and feeder cattle prices. We're really starting to see an uptick in, in finished cattle prices. It's a good thing. Um, we're close to year levels. I expect that prices this week will be above last year's prices uh, for the first time in several uh, months. Uh, it goes all the way back to August since we had above year go level prices. But I, I really do think this this week we may be pushing up into the the 115, 116 uh, price level on finished cattle, which is a is, is a really good thing. We've we've already started to see demand. Uh, for the uh, holiday buying has already kicked in in the beef in the beef market, so that's supporting uh, finished cattle prices, um, and so I, th I think we're going to see a positive movement from that. Uh, we look here at five to six weight steer prices, and and I mean it has been a sorry market all year. I, I'm for for to to be kind and 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 use as kind of words as I can, it's just been a sorry market. Uh, when, you're, when you're averaging uh, $10 below year ago prices for most of the year, uh, most, most people weren't making a whole lot of money last year with, with, with last year's prices. And uh, it was only that, that spring peak that we saw back in late April, early May, that even resembled a market that looked like it might have a little strength in it. Um, and then when we got, by the time we got to June, this market had, had fell apart and, and it never recovered. And it doesn't look like it's gonna recover by the end of the year a whole lot. I mean, we might start see prices uptick a little bit in December for, for these calf prices, but uh, it, it's been tough. And so those, those folks that were marketing these, these five, and, five to six weight calves, lightweight cattle this, this fall uh, have come under some severe duress and um, they've definitely experienced some low prices and uh, you know a, a, a steer calf at this price level at this weight class is about seven hundred dollars a head you take uh probably sixty or seventy dollars off of that for its heifer mate and uh if you even have a hundred percent calving rate and a weaning rate you know you're looking at uh, maybe averaging six hundred and seventy uh six hundred and sixty to six hundred and seventy dollars per head of revenue on each cow, um, that, that's tough. That's tough to make money in that business. Uh, I'm going to skip over. Uh, well, I, I can show for those that care about seven to eight weight, just weekly auction run cattle. You know, this is this is weekly auction run, so going through the market one at a time. Whereas we've seen, we saw uh, in the past two or three weeks, we've had a lot of loads of cattle that were eight weights. Uh, eight to eight fifties, and a lot of those cattle were bringing 140 to 142, 143 area. So we've got a really, I mean, the, the feeder cattle market has actually started to strengthen a little bit. And you know, when I say that, let's let's go back. I'm, I mean, we're talking about eight load lots of eight weight cattle uh, bringing 140, 141, 142, 143, and then we back up to these five and six weight steer calves that are going through the auction one at a time, and we're down here averaging 133 last week. So, you know, we talk about how weight, as, as weight goes up, price goes down. Now, we're not talking about equivalent cattle here. We're talking about cattle that are straightened out, uh, ready to go, and they're bulletproof going in the feedlot at those eight weights that, 
that have been preconditioned selling in load lots, whereas these high risk cattle, uh, this time of year, <clears throat> I mean, people, we, we've had some extreme temperature variation when we were in the upper 90s in October, the first week of October, and here we are in the middle of November and we're down to, I mean, I saw 10 degrees on my truck, is what registered on my truck this morning when I got in it. Um, you know, 60 degrees this weekend, 10 degrees today. Uh, there's a lot of cattle that, that suffer through that, that type of <clears throat> uh, temperature change, which means a high risk, which means I, I can't pay as much for that calf if I'm gonna bring him in and try to straighten him out. Um, slaughter cow prices, I mean, actually for, for the number of cows that we have been slaughtering, this is still a pretty decent price for, for slaughter cows. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we had our highest cow kill last week that we've had since uh, I think probably May of 2013 or something like that. So, you know, coming out of May 2013, we've still had a few places that were in, in severe drought from that 2012 drought. The Southern Plains was still in severe drought, and so they were still selling off cows in May of 13. And so we literally had the, the largest slaughter cow kill last week. I think it was close to 70,000 head or something. I'll show the graph here in a second. I just don't remember at the top of my head. Biggest cow, cow, cow kill, and yet we still have prices above year ago levels. Um, and a lot of that's because we're not importing as much beef right now. We've, we've slowed down on importing uh, some lean manufacturing beef as of late. And so that's been supporting this uh, uh, cow kill. Uh, but before we, we get up, we get to there, uh, just, you know, heifer slaughter so far is up 7.5%. Steer slaughter is down 2.4%. And beef cow slaughter is up 3.1%. And, and that's important because that, that, that's one of the reasons why I'm changing what I think on prices because we, we see steer slaughter has remained below year go levels, below year go levels, below year, for, for essentially 10 months, uh, we're 10 and a half months in this, into this year, and steer slaughter has never caught back up. I would have, through the first six months of this year, I would have said steer slaughter would come back and we'd be about even with year go levels. Well, we're, we haven't, and, and the thought was that there were still cattle out there that hadn't come to, to harvest. Well, they, they never have, and I don't know where they could be. If they haven't showed up, they're not gonna show up now. Um, we've increased this beef cow slaughter, we've increased this heifer cow slaughter. So now I'm starting to project that, that we're probably gonna see a half a percent, probably a half of a percent to a 1% decline in, in cattle numbers uh, as of January 1. Uh, whereas I was thinking we'd be up th three tenths of a percent to maybe seven tenths of a percent. Uh, I flip flopped on us and now I'm down about a half a percent to a full percent um, going into 2020 because of how many heifers and how many cows we are harvesting. Um, just to, just to, sh to demonstrate, you can see, well, there it is. It sure enough is right at 70,000 head last week of cows that were, were harvested uh, way above any, any other week that we've seen in the past uh, two years. And, uh, way above any of the five uh, year average line there. You know, this time of year, we generally do see an increase in cow slaughter because the same time people are, are killing these, are, are marketing their calves, their fresh weanling calves, they're also taking these cold cows to the market and uh, trying to get some salvage value out of them. But uh, it just, just goes to show, that's another reason why I think we're gonna, we're gonna see uh, decline in our in our beef cow herd uh, come 2020. Which, if we have a smaller cow herd, then we can be looking for a smaller calf crop, which should help support prices to some degree. Um, even though we've uh, reduced steer slaughter, the heifer slaughter and the cow slaughter has kept beef production up a half a percent. Um, cattle weights have been increasing, but they've been been below year ago levels for most of the year, which has helped help support beef prices. We've had, a, we, we keep on producing more and more hogs. I mean, we're just making, producing more pork than what we know what to do with. Um, and, and China, you know, we really want to ship it all to China, but China and, and the United States aren't on the best of terms right now and, and maybe something will work out there. And then we keep on producing more chicken. Um, folks, there's just a lot of meat to eat. Uh, if you like to eat meat, man, this is your time. Um, if you don't like meat and uh, you're just in this business for poops and giggles and you're a vegetarian, well, 
maybe you should start eating meat and it'll help your business out. Um, that's just a, you know, a little thought process there, but, uh, if you, you know, maybe convince you, you, your vegan neighbor that, that meat is what they need. And, or maybe you could just disguise it as one of them beyond burgers or impossible whoppers and say, yeah, that's one of them fake ones, but here it is. They taste the same, they claim. Um, but you know, that's, that's, we got a lot of meat and it's going to be tough to get rid of all of it. Uh, I guess we better go to the, to what's happening. You know, I, I put up here, China, never heard of it. I'm about tired of hearing about China. Um, I realized that, uh, China has a lot of people, you know, when you're talking about a billion people, billion mouths to feed, that's great. Um, uh, but we've never shipped we've never shipped a lot of beef there, so I'm not worried about the beef side of it. You know, it's mainly a pork a pork situation and mainly a soybean situation that that's that's focused there. But what a lot of people don't understand is it really doesn't matter. The the, the big issue here is China has lost a large portion of their pork production because of the African swine fever, and it doesn't really matter who sends meat to China that means that it's disappearing. So there's, there's disappearance that occurs there. And some people will call that a consumption, but it's disappearance. And that means that we will have product that can fill in other gaps in other countries. It doesn't really matter. Sure, you'd prefer to have direct trade with these countries, um, but our meat will go somewhere and it'll help support prices. Uh, the Japan deal couldn't, I mean, that is a good deal for the United States beef industry. Uh, you can thank uh, you can thank uh, your president and his administration for that. Um, the NAFTA USMCA, um, you know my my sentiments are signed the darn thing. Uh, right now you're just uh, you're cra you're trying to make an enemy out of a out of a out of a friend. And if you want to keep tariff rates low and you want to keep stuff moving across these borders, um, as far as marketable products because there's other things moving across the borders that other people disagree with or agree with and i mean that's how we got aaron uh he moved across the border and here he is um so there you go um but anyway you know beyond that we need we need this trade agreement and we have congress that's holding it up uh for who knows what reason um if they if they can come up with a better one that's great uh, but let's go ahead and get this one enacted and then we can work on something better uh, but here's here's that import that I showed you. You know, if you go back even into June, we've had below a year ago level uh, imports of beef, and most of that's going to be lean grinding beef. Hey, and this time of year, seasonally declines. Why is it seasonally decline? Because we're killing a lot more of those slaughter cows. We don't need as much lean grinding beef in the fall months because we are producing a lot of it domestically. But other times of year, we import a lot of it because we're not killing as many cattle. We need more grinding beef. We have a higher demand for, for uh, ground beef during the summer months, uh, so forth and so on and so forth. In, exports remain fairly strong. We've had a few weak months relative to a year ago, but last year was a very, very strong year for exports. I mean, extremely strong year. And this year is, is no exception. I mean, it's, it's been a good year as well. It might be below year ago levels, but hey, they, it's been a good export year. Um, I think I just wrote an article for, T I don't know, maybe it was TCA or something else, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I, I detail a little bit more of this in, a, in an article I recently wrote. Um, maybe that we're still exporting a good, a good uh, quantity of product. Our value has, has started to slip a little bit, which would, would indicate that uh, international, our export demand may be a little softer than, than what it once was, but domestic demand remains very strong, so that's, that's, that's good. Um, just to show you here that uh, this is the choice, this is the, the box beef cutout value. Um, choice prices are starting to escalate. Uh, the, the, the price that you see right here uh, back in August and September, that, that's, that's when we had the Tyson fire, the Holcomb facility, slaughter facility fire out in Kansas. Uh, but we're starting to see this, this increase in this choice cutout price is indicative of, of the holiday buying. So most of these people that are buying prime ribs and, 
and steak cuts that, that folks are going to eat on during the holidays, that purchasing is going on right now. They don't wait till December to start buying that, that stuff, those products. Uh, so if you're going to go to the store and buy it or your next door neighbor's going to go buy, go out and buy it, it's because it's being, it's actually physically being purchased or contracted right now. And, uh, and so it'll get to your store shelves, uh, by the time you want it. Um, you know, I think it's still imperative to show this drought monitor situation because mainly because of this Texas situation, uh, a lot of cattle in Texas and, and the whole, unfortunately the whole central part of Texas from North to South is, is eat up with, with a drought situation. And, and we, we can, I think we can sympathize with that a little bit considering that August and September or maybe September and October, however you figure it in there, uh, but we had eight good weeks of dry, dry weather in this state uh, across most parts of it. And so, you know, there were probably people starting to wonder what they were going to do. Probably people started, you know, having to utilize their, their forage resources, their hay resources earlier than expected. And, you know, you can expect that same thing to be happening down here where uh, the largest cattle population is. I'm not going to, that doesn't really matter. I'm not too... Aaron's already talked about corn prices, but guess what, folks? Corn prices are cheap. It's, feed, it's cheap to feed cattle. Hay prices are fairly inexpensive on a national level, but uh, what it really comes down to is how cheap it is to feed cattle. Uh, the cattle that just came out out of Kansas based off of uh, focus on feedlots, uh, cattle that just came off of, of feed in September averaged around 82, 83, 83 cents uh, per pound to put on uh, that's all their cost. It's, it says feeding cost, but it's actually all the cost uh, of feeding cattle. And uh, and I only expect it to get cheaper if this corn stays uh, in check. Um, now let's let's look real quick at uh, uh, this is the April uh, feeder cattle contract. Uh, you know, there's a lot of optimism in the market. A lot of optimism. That's I mean, book that one down right now. Uh, we've got we've got a feeder cattle market. So this is essentially represents an eight weight steer um, in the in the central part of this country. Uh, but at 148 is what it closed at yesterday for April. I think that's very, very strong market. I, I just told you we just had, you know, eight to 850 pound feeder cattle in this state selling in load lots between 140 and 143 uh, this, this within the past two to three weeks. And so when you think of it from that standpoint, and we're talking about escalating prices. Hey, 148 is a, a, a good price. Man can make some money at 148. And then let's fast forward because I mean, hopefully April catches some of you. You know what prices are today, and then April will catch some of you. And then let's move all the way into August. I mean, we're talking about 150 between 152 and 153 is where where we're sitting, and we've been trading all week and all the last week. I mean, we're, we're talking about a really strong market. We were nowhere near 152 or 153. You know, last April, the August feeder cattle contract last April for the, the August that just passed got up to 161, 162, and most people didn't take advantage of that. And so this just this is pointing towards the importance of, of price risk management to some degree. And that's what I'm, I'm fixing to talk about LRP insurance and show you what's available right now. Uh, for folks that don't have load lots of cattle that can't put together 50,000 pounds of cattle. But we're, we're talking about a very, very strong price. And a 152 August price might be a profitable price for most people that are selling eight weight cattle um, come next uh, August. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to my, my here, here are my price projections. Uh, the seven to eight weight heifers and steers are for load lots. The five to six weight steers are for auction run cattle. Uh, you can take a quick snapshot of that, kind of pick where you might be marketing between now and, and August. I didn't get into next fall. Uh, I didn't get back to October because it's tough, it's tough enough to predict uh, uh, as far out as, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to change that on you uh, so quickly. But, but you can kind of get an idea of, of what I'm expecting for these, these cattle prices moving forward. Um, for those that are doing some backgrounding, uh, just here's a November to April uh, expected value of gain given today's current prices. You know, 525 can a 525 pound steer can be bought for 137. 
with my April expected price around $1.40. So what I'm telling you that if you bought 500 or you own 525 pound calves right now, you can literally lock in $1.40 uh, given our, our average basis that we generally experience in Tennessee in April, you could lock in a price of 140 and that would give you an expected value of gain of $1.45. That is a strong value of gain. Um, even if we, went down, if we go down to $1.24 as a sale price, which means we lose $16 based off of my expectation, you're still above a dollar value of gain. Now your death loss and your feed cost is what you really have to account for in there. So, um, you know, depending on what you're feeding, uh, the feedlot's doing it for, for 80 or so cents a pound. Uh, we should be able to do it cheaper than that especially if you're on grass or if you have a, uh, uh, I saw Larry Moorhead was on, you know, if you live in a place where like Larry does, they have a cheap feed resource there in, in Jack Daniels. Um, you know, and, and you, if you calculate, you plop in a three or 4% death loss on average, you're, you're going to make good money on these cattle regardless. Um, let's go to December to May, a very similar picture. Uh, very, very similar picture as what we just showed. Uh, so that kind of does that, but because I'm, I'm running out of time, I mean, I'm already, that's, that's all I wanted to present. Um, but, uh, let's see, I want to stop sharing that one and I want to share a different screen real quick, uh, with folks. Um, is that, is that very visible? Is it, is it not very visible? It's a little, it's a little small. Okay, well let me let me uh, let me readjust it then. I can. Uh, I'll tell you, I do it like this. I bet you this this may be big enough now. When I go to share it, is it is it showing now? A little bigger. Uh, we can't see it yet. Did you share it? Well, uh, oh wait, here we go. What about now? Yeah, it's better. Okay, so here's our LRP insurance. I a, a few months back, probably two meetings ago, I talked about LRP making changes uh, to their uh, to the product. It was going to have more options available, so more things, more prices to look at, more time periods, and uh, and they've made those changes. Uh, the subsidy level has gone from 13% to anywhere from 20 to 35%. And this cost per hundred weight that I'm showing here in this, what I'm pointing at, if, if you look to the far right there and you see cost per hundred weight, that does not include the subsidy. Um, so you could almost, you know, like I've got a, the $5.36 here. Well, 20% would be a dollar and, and, and some odd cents there. Uh, about a dollar and five, dollar and six, something like that. But uh, maybe a dollar nine. But the point is, is we've got a, this LRP. I think is becoming a little more viable to be used um, as a product to hedge uh, these calf prices. And you can you can literally do one calf. If all you have is one calf to sell, you could you could buy insurance on one calf. Whereas, whereas the futures, futures and options are 50,000 pound contracts. So I, I'm looking at this and I highlighted this is for a March sale. You can see everything above that would be for an expected sale around February 11th, but for an expected sale around the 1st of March, uh, you could lock in a price of 146 uh, and then just subtract out your, your premium cost and that would give you a floor price uh, if, if let's see, if we take off a dollar, we're at 436, so around 14150, 14160, uh, somewhere in that range. Uh, for, for, for March, I think this is something that folks ought to start considering. I'm not saying it's time to purchase this, but as I scroll down, you can see that we have things that go all the way out to September of next year already. There, there are insurance that can be purchased all the way out to September. Now, the farther you go out, the more expensive it's going to be. Uh, but, but if you're looking to, if, if a lot of people probably wish they would have done this last last year, when like I said, when futures prices went up to 162 in in April, uh, and then we got to August, 
and they were down to 130 some odd dollars, you know, insurance like this would have really, really paid off. I'm not saying go out there and just buy insurance to be buying insurance to say you're insured. Make sure it's a profitable level for you. If you're gonna purchase insurance or if you're gonna hedge cattle on, on the futures market, you've got to make sure uh, that you're hedging a profit. Uh, there's no sense in hedging a loss. Um, but, but I just wanted to show you, I mean, y'all probably never looked at this, but prior to the, the changes in the program, I mean, there's, there's probably 50 different alternatives on this page that I'm scrolling through. And, and if it would have been the, before they made the changes they made, we might've had like 15 instead of 50. Uh, so it just wasn't very flexible of a product. 